Welcome to our CyberSafe Digest weekly podcast, episode 22. Each week, we will unfold the most recent cyber attacks and will provide you with valuable insights on how to shield your business from these threats, along with practical steps and tips to enhance your cybersecurity. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 22 of the CyberSafe Digest. I'm Martin Roberts, Managing Director of New Ways. I am here with... Toby Stevenson, Chief Technology Officer at New Ways. Right, Toby, we're continuing our series really about educating uh, our target audience about uh, uh, IT security. Uh, typically, this, this podcast is aimed at uh, CFOs, CEOs, people that are responsible for IT, but don't necessarily execute IT. And we've been going through some of the basics uh, so far. Um, it's good to be able to go to a cocktail party and when somebody asks you what you do and you say you're responsible for IT, you can talk about it with some authority. A very useful skill, yeah. Very useful skill indeed. And and so this week we're going to talk about endpoint security. Okay. And I'd, and I'd like to really um, help people understand what the difference between endpoint security and all the other types of security that should be deployed in a an organisation. Sure. Okay. So endpoint security, as the name kind of alludes to, is the security that resides on an endpoint system. So be that a laptop, a desktop, um, arguably even servers, um, maybe even mobile phones. It's discreetly different from network security, which would be something that sits on the network and protects the network as yeah. opposed to the endpoint. So if we think about the PC and its Windows environment and all the applications, the endpoint security is responsible for protecting that little silo of, of activity. Sure. Network security is, is things that run across the network, so that might include network scanning. Uh, firewalls are often included in there because they're a network level activity okay. because they're sort of coming in and going out of them, and there's an opportunity to um, perform security scanning on there. Um, email security, which we have all heard about, you know, that helps protect us against phishing and yeah. um, email-borne malware. Web security, kind of two flavours to that, really. The first is the technology that protects you when you're browsing the internet yeah. so protects you from malicious websites and, and things like that the other aspect of web security is how you protect web-based resources so web servers database servers how they're protected and there's a a, a separate kind of niche area of, of protection there which isn't really that common in small to medium-sized businesses but the others all are yeah. I, I guess one of the questions i suppose well, one of the, the thoughts that spring to mind is that you know network security as an example is something that is you, you'd say is enterprise based um i would say static within the organization so if you're in the office yeah you've yeah. got you 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 build network security around that exactly whereas if you're a, a user of a laptop mm. uh, or other device which travels with you yeah the endpoint security is obviously go travels with you Yes. Yeah. 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 And and I suppose really the, the the big transformation we saw there was was with the lockdown and pandemic. Yes. When a lot of people went from being every day in the office, sat behind the corporate firewall, and very rarely worked from home. Yes. Um, they suddenly went to working from home overnight, and all of those fantastic protections that had been invested in and were afforded by the company yeah. to people within the company premises no longer applied, and therefore endpoint became the new frontier in terms of protecting the organization oh, it's an ill wind that doesn't blow any place <laughs> something good as the old saying goes um, okay so is it been a fundamental shift has it become just become more important um you know i think i think it's it's there is a fundamental shift there because the way that people are working is different now yeah. and and threats have advanced to capitalize on this lack of centralized protection yes and so it's therefore critically important now that the endpoint is is protected no more no less than uh than the network security yeah. firewalls but it's an equally important facet and one that can't be overlooked and do and it, you know, when you come back to the office is is the value of that endpoint security negated or lost or does it still add a huge value no, i still think it adds huge value because the kinds of attacks that endpoint security is protecting against yeah aren't always seen by the firewall because it may be behavior on the machine that the firewall doesn't yeah, see. Sure. And likewise, the firewall can protect against things that the endpoint hasn't yet seen 
Yeah, so it's, it's that layered defence, that defence in depth. So it's still really, really important. Yeah, so I mean, that I'm just going to talk about that layered defence and defence in depth. That, that there is this concern sometimes, or there's this idea that I've gone out and I've bought product X, I won't mention products, and, and therefore I'm okay. And if, you, you know, if you're a small business, just going out and buying some some product or or getting downloading some free product mm. won't give you that defense in depth it's it's i mean but think about cost considerations if you're a, a, an sme a small business you know four or five users you know does does this defense in depth thing work where is it better to invest in in the network defense? You know, buying a better router, or is it better to do endpoint? Or really, should you do both? Well, really, in an ideal world, you should do both. Yeah. If you had to do one or the other, it would be, or if you had to prioritize one over the other, you would need to look at the way that the business was working, where the data was stored. Sure. If you've got a large, relatively static workforce, yeah, and they are anchored to the desk in the company offices or it's uh, you know shop floor or factory or something like that and these are not activities that can easily be taken out of the, the premises yeah. then you may choose to prioritize network security yes. over endpoint because yeah. in in when you look at what your risks are they're all things that are coming in yeah. and you have visibility of everything that's coming sure. in sure. if you are an organization that is using a lot of cloud services you perhaps have a very mobile um, workforce so whether it be uh, you know, traveling salespeople or field engineers, um, that kind of thing, um, then endpoint is probably where you would want to prioritize if you had to make that choice because you can't control where you can, yeah. of course, buy a firewall for everyone and have to put that in their home. <laughs> but A, it's very expensive, oh, B, it's hard to manage, and C, you know, the kids on the Xbox or the PlayStation, are, are, yeah. you're not going to be uh, high on their list of favourite people if you're blocking all the things that they want to do well, as that'll well. That'll explain what's gone wrong at home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess, I suppose that what this highlights really is that um, the, the concept of going out and buying something which will do the job is actually far more complex than, than we'd like to imagine it is. It is, and I think the other thing as well is that is that a lot of these security things, particularly now, it's not just a one and done. You have yeah. to, probably the biggest piece of advice with anyone that buys any any product, any security product, is make sure that you or you have somebody that is monitoring the logs. Yeah. I can give you a great anecdotal story. I won't, I won't name the organisation in, in question, but there was a, a company and they invested quite a large sum of money in, in some sophisticated endpoint security software yeah. and they got ransomware and of course they were livid they went to the vendors and, and, and to the resellers and said, yeah. what's going on here we spent all this money you told us it was the best thing ever yeah what's happened okay well, well we'll investigate and take a look turned out that actually a device had been compromised before the software was put in uh -huh. and a bad actor had been attempting to compromise the system for 30 days before they were successful. And they knew once they compromised it, because they were on, they could see that the IT department were on an away day somewhere, team building activity. Really and so that's when they struck because they knew that the company couldn't respond well. You well. See, I have an import that all crooks and, and people and hackers and such like a, a lazy people who don't want to get go and get a proper job. But actually, that's quite a lot of hard work there, isn't it? It is a lot of hard work. Yeah, it is a lot of hard work. But the, the, the moral of the story here is that if their IT team had been looking at the logs, they would have seen all these numerous these attempts activities, yeah, sure. beforehand. But because they thought, I bought this super product, it's protecting me. And actually, they were getting the emails that said, oh, okay. we, we blocked this yeah. threat. We've, and they thought, pat themselves on the back, great, we've yeah. got the threat. <laughs> but they've not really taken it to the next one. So, well, but what does that mean? How did that get yeah. in? What's happening? And then if they'd have done that, they could have followed the breadcrumbs to find out that actually there was a, a compromise on it on an account somewhere and, yeah. and a bad guy was in. I suppose that that displays that the expertise in the product and what it's telling you and understanding that is, is really well. I'm I'm one of the worst people in that. I As we've just demonstrated with these microphones, actually, <laughs> the last thing I ever look at is the manual. Yeah, I'll press every single button first and change every configuration first until it doesn't work. And I'll, I'll tell you about my infrared heater in my one of the rooms at home later on, oh <laughs> two days before I actually looked at the video. But the, the reality is, is that if you go and buy a new piece of software, you install it and you think it should work. It should be plug and play. Yeah. And and, and it's, it's not always, it will work well enough. Most products work well enough with the default settings. Yes. 
and that's great. But the important thing is is to keep an eye on it. So look look at the logs. Even if you're running the the most expensive or even the cheapest, look at the yeah. logs. So when yeah. you get an alert, yeah, you follow it up and say, do I need to do anything else with this? Is, is this because what happens is that when a, a, a bad actor gets on, the endpoint security software may detect an artifact yeah. of the attack. Yeah. So that thing that you see may not be the only activity that's going on. It's just what's been detected and flagged. And when you then go to look at the logs, you can see there's a chain of other events that perhaps suggests yeah. um, more actions required. The one thing that always comes out here is about the cost. And the problem is with all these things, it's a little bit like insurance. It's absolutely like insurance, yeah. So basically, you buy these things, you put them in place, and and if they're really good, you never have a problem. Mm. It's only when you have a problem do they pay for themselves. Mm. So that actually, in reality, folks, they're paying for themselves all the time if they're just working. Well, I mean, uh, it's not endpoint security, it's email security, which we touched on earlier. But um, I once had a conversation with somebody that says, why do I need this particular product? Yeah. Because we never get any spam. Yes, yes. that's because the product <laughs> is doing its job. So yeah, yeah. It, it can almost be self-defeating, the, the, the effectiveness of a product, because you don't see big problems. Yeah you assume that you don't have them, but actually it might no, be just in a really good job. You know, we're, we're an MSP and, and occasionally we get customers turn around to us and say, well, what am I paying for? I never have any problems. So, mm. you know, what, why am I giving you all this money? Mm. Exactly. And yeah. it's because you're not having any problems. Uh, yeah. We're actually doing a lot of stuff in the background. Okay. Is it, is it, well, it's a choice to have endpoint security, but mm. uh, any security, I mean, is a, is it an obligation to? No, there isn't. No, I mean, you'll probably have a very hard time getting any kind of insurance sure. if you don't have endpoint security installed. In fact, most insurance companies now are alluding to the fact that you need endpoint uh, detection and response, or EDR, which was yeah. on the previous podcast. Yeah. That's almost becoming a, a, a de facto standard now if you want to get insurance. Yeah, but of course, there's that, there's that problem. And again, it's about looking, we, we mentioned this in a previous podcast, and then also we talked about uh, EDR in episode 20 and NDR in 21. Is this this idea that you need to also look at your insurance? Don't just don't just tick a box on the insurance um, uh, as, a, as an addendum to your normal insurance. Don't just accept what you're being told. Look at it in detail because uh, it, they'll take your money. Mm. Um, but if in the event that you've not complied by getting endpoint um, uh, security or whatever is, is defined there, then they won't pay out. Absolutely, yeah. And, and there may be exclusions depending yeah. on what solutions you are or are not running. Yeah. So, yeah, they may pay out for some things, but not for others. And and by the way, just, just so if, uh, people understand, they wouldn't pay out because it's quite a reasonable thing to do because you've not read the terms and conditions and not complied with what's required to fulfil the requirements of the insurance. Yeah, well, I mean, if, you, if you've got a, a burglar alarm yeah. on your house and you declare that on your insurance and you don't turn it on and you leave the front door unlocked, yeah. you know, you're going to have an awkward conversation with them when you want to claim for, for contents that have been stolen. You certainly would. Right. Now, people. Those, those those humans that are at the end of these endpoints. Yes. What what influence can they have? Does it does it make them safer, or can they ignore what it's telling? Well, we talked about what people are ignoring what it can tell them, but also does it just putting an endpoint security on an endpoint on a laptop on a computer? You know, is that the end of the story? Uh, it's not. No, I mean, it can certainly help immensely. Yeah. Um, but it's part of a, a suite of. of Actions that you take this defense in depth. Yeah, yeah. We want to make sure that there is something on the system that can identify malicious code, yeah. ideally that can un- identify malicious or suspect behavior and, yeah. and, and create alerts and take action around that. But we also want to limit, let's call it the blast radius as well. So we want to take away as many rights from the, uh, yeah. the user of the machine as possible. So we've touched on that before. Yes. It don't be a, an administrator on your daily account because if something happens to you, the reach is much greater. Yes. Think about what you're clicking on and where you're going. You know, we touched on the, the importance of email training, yeah. so, so understanding and what to look out for when uh, an email comes in that's got that, that uh, critical call to action on it. Sure. You know, it, It's out of the blue, it's, it's unusual, it's unexpected, maybe there's spelling mistakes, although with AI, the quality oh. of the content is getting much better now. So it's, it's, it's the things that, that are, the call to action is really the big thing to look for there. So you're just being aware of those things uh, because even with email security and network security and endpoint security, yeah. there's every chance that a phishing email will still get through to your inbox and 
the end user needs to be able to distinguish and determine that. Now, even if that email does get through and they do click on it, yeah. there is still the opportunity for the endpoint software yeah. to protect them, the network security to protect them, and any web security to protect them. So the, the protection comes in and goes out as well. Yeah. But ultimately, the attackers are trying to trick the fleshy body that's yeah. on the end of the keyboard into doing something that gives them then an advantage. So yeah, making sure that people are suspicious, they understand what they're looking for, and how they should behave. So we, yes. we've, we've spoke before about the importance of policies. Yes. You know, if you don't give people an instruction manual of how to work within the company, how do they know what good looks like? You know, how, how do they know what is acceptable behaviour? Yeah, and, and we'll talk in a future episode about shadow IT yeah. and, and those people who are really capable um, but dangerous. Mm. But that's it, Rob. Okay, so we talked about success. What is success for an endpoint? I guess it not being compromised and identifying um, things before they happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's one of these weird kind of inverse things that you yeah. measure success by how how quiet it actually is, how how little in the way of alerts and, yeah. and detections that you're getting. So that said, you should still expect to receive alerts. The important thing there is following up on them. So what I would say, rather than counting the number of alerts or detections, yeah. it's the number of resolved incidents. Yes. So when something occurs, what you want to be doing is following that through and making sure that nothing else needs to be done and then closing that down. I, I guess, I mean, we, we talked about people, small businesses, perhaps with their own IT person, mm. IT department, um, uh, large businesses as well, of course. Um, and then, you know, if you're using an MSP, somebody to do your IT for you is, is, is asking the question of them, you know, what what's the thought I got in place? They're charging you for it potentially, and if they're not, uh, ask the question, what's in, what's in place for my endpoint security? Um, check it out make sure that you've got something yeah i think i think it's a really important one because a lot of the security landscape is evolving so quickly yes that it's sometimes hard for msps to keep pace with it and some msps are very good at providing support yes but they don't necessarily have the expertise or the bandwidth internally to to offer comprehensive security solutions and it's about understanding what they are doing and what they're not doing. I yeah. think that's really important. I think, I mean, I'd, I'd say as the, as the MD of you know, New Ways, that the change of focus in the last 10 years has been absolutely staggering. Mm. And part of it you know, upsets me a great deal in that money used to be spent on making IT better and making IT do more. Now the focus is about making IT safe. Yeah, and resilient, resilient. As, as opposed to, yeah, be more efficient, yeah. more user-friendly. Yeah. That almost Which takes a really, back seat. Yeah. Really, really sad. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Toby. Uh, great stuff. So now we get to that point of acronym of the week, which is sort of related to this whole episode, really. And this is UEM. And for those in that, we, we, we could run a competition here and just say, right, in the next week, well, uh, whoever wins by identifying what UEM is. No, but we weren't. <laughs> I say, so unified endpoint management. What, what's the difference? Well, what, what is unified endpoint management? Um, so it's, it's a tool that a lot of MSPs will end up using. It, it's, it's historically been called um, remote monitoring and management, an RMM tool. Right. So it's a piece of software that allows the IT department, more common in large IT departments, yes. but also with, with managed service providers to look after the estate of the, yeah. uh, of the, of the customer or of the, the internal resources. It's essentially a piece of software that sits on every endpoint yeah. and it's capturing data around what the machine is doing. So disk space, memory, CPU, applications are installed, things like that. Um, and it gives you the ability to run um, commands against it so you can manage the environment so mm. it's it's a it's a management tool that allows you to, to manage at scale so rather than having to install a piece of software manually on 50 computers yeah. you can push a command that says push this piece of software out to all 50 machines for example okay so if you're that ceo cfo the people we like to talk to really it's it's to ask your your provider your your internal people yeah. whatever you know what what a unified endpoint management are we using? Are we using it at all? What's the value of it? I mean, the, I mean, it is valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 you have to use it correctly. You have to secure it correctly yes. because it carry can carry its own inherent risks. Yes. So again, it's one of these things that it's not just a one and done. Yeah. You have to deploy it, and then you have to manage uh, it. Manage it properly. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, certainly once you get over a certain size, people don't want to be having a team of staff going around PCs manually installing software or changing configurations. It's kind of 
tooling that you need. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Toby. Um, great insights as, as per usual. Um, so that that was episode 22. 23 next time, we're going to talk about the dark web. Ooh, exciting. Um, which is a, an interesting uh, uh, thing, I am sure. And we're going to give people lots of music. And it's frightening, but fascinating. Um, and uh, we'll talk about how you get to it, what, what does it do, how people use it and such like. Uh, but for this week, uh, thank you very much, Toby. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We've reached the end of episode 22 of our CyberSafe Digest weekly podcast. Thank you very much for listening. And to make sure you don't miss out on our future episodes, hit that subscribe button on Spotify, Apple or Google podcast. For more cybersecurity wisdom and resources, head over to our website at cybersafe.co.uk. See you next Thursday.